Initial jobless claims rose 11.7% in California during the week of November 13th, while dropping 12.2% in the rest of the country. California and Nevada were tied in having the nation's highest unemployment rate coming in at 7.3% in October of this year. California was hit hard by the pandemic, and despite having added more jobs than any other state has, it has maintained high levels of unemployment. The state lost more than 3 million jobs in the first three months alone. Reports of a mismatch between available job openings and worker skills, as well as a slowly recovering tourism industry, point to a complicated recovery for the state. Some experts say that state economy may not fully recover until 2023. With high numbers of job openings, over 1.5 million available in September, state's unemployment level is expected to drop, but the gap is closing slowly. California's unemployment dropped slightly in November following the end of pandemic unemployment-related benefits, but it does remain high. Nationally, the unemployment growth slowed in November, but unemployment dropped to a 21-month low of 4.2% nationwide. Next, California's last nuclear power plant is set to close in 2025, but there are growing calls for it to remain open in order to sustain California's power supplies and avoid increased rolling black. Blackouts. PG&E owned Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant, located in San Luis Obispo County, is set to close in 2025. The last remaining nuclear power plant in California is over 40 years old. Proponents of its closure cite its age and the fact that it sits upon multiple fault lines, as well as concerns for overutilizing seawater as a coolant as reasons for its closure. In a recent interview, however, U.S. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm said that the state should reconsider its closure. The Biden administration's plan to decarbonize the nation's energy supply includes a more nuclear-friendly stance. In addition, a recent November study published by Stanford and MIT professors on utilizing nuclear energy as a way to reach California's clean energy goals. PG&E announced in 2016 that it would close the plant due to financial and operational concerns. According to the California Public Utility Commission spokesperson, the licenses for the plant could not be extended without upgrades to the plant, and no proposals have been received so far. Next, California's mortgage relief program is still pending. The website still holds fast with stating that they are awaiting funding from the Treasury upon having their program approved. Now, there is one slight development here. There is a find out if you are eligible contact form here, so I want to make sure that I share that link with you, which is available down in the video description. Next, over 30,000 farm workers in California are now eligible for pay increases in 2022 after a Trump era proposed wage freeze was overturned in court. The 2020 proposed farm worker wage freeze, which was issued by former President Trump, has been overturned in court, impacting over 30,000 farm workers in California. In 2020, the president called for a wage freeze for guest farm workers, meaning that they could not receive wages or raises above 2019 levels. Farm worker advocates who initiated the lawsuit against the order said that it put the financial burden on the low paid guest workers during a year when they were considered essential workers. Farm workers impacted are those holding H 2A visas for agricultural work. Next, California has reported the first case of the Omicron variant in the United States. A traveler from South Africa tested positive for the Omicron variant of COVID-19, the first case of the variant in the country. While President Biden issued a November 26 proclamation barring travel from several countries, including South Africa, that ban did not include U.S. citizens. The traveler was vaccinated and was only experiencing mild symptoms. The state has been in touch with all close contacts of the infected person, and all have been tested negative thus far. Next, a COVID-19 pill by Merck and Company was approved in a narrow vote by the FDA advisory panel. The pill, which is already authorized for use in Great Britain, won approval from the FDA advisory panel in a 10 to 13 vote on Tuesday. Although the FDA does not have to follow the advisory panel's vote, a recent study has shown that in the past, they followed the panel's guidelines 78% of the time. 
The antiviral pill was initially found to be 50% effective at combating severe illness and death from the COVID-19 virus. However, a more recent test has shown the pill to be closer to 30% effective. The pill was not approved for use in children due to the possibility of adverse effects on development, and Merck has stated that it will not be seeking approval for that demographic. If the FDA approves the pill, it will likely come with restrictions for women who are or may become pregnant, as there are indications that it can adversely affect fetal development. Dr. Lindsay Badin, a Harvard infectious disease specialist who serves on the advisory board, indicated that while many members of the panel were concerned about the possible mutations and long-term developmental effects of the pill, it can be beneficial for those who are in high-risk groups, such as the unvaccinated, obese, or the elderly. The pill has not been studied in vaccinated adults. Pfizer has also asked for FDA emergency authorization of its COVID-19 pill.